Good afternoon, happy holidays, and welcome to the December Wonders of the World or WOW lecture series. WOW is sponsored by the Friends of the Lafayette Library and Learning Center, which is the all volunteer organization that sells used books to support the Lafayette Library. And I'm Ellen Reinges, the volunteer coordinator for the WOW program. Our lecture today is about mid 20th century American abstractionist painters. And our speaker today is Avril Angevine. The Friends of the Library are continuing to offer the WOW lectures and the Sweet Thursday author events online as webinars. We're in the process of scheduling new events and here are a few upcoming attractions. The next two WOW webinars listed below are scheduled in Zoom and there will be registration links in the follow-up email tomorrow. On Wednesday, January 12th, 2022, WOW will host a docent from the Legion of Honor who will discuss the current exhibit, Color into Line, Pastels from the Renaissance to the Present. And then on Wednesday, February 9th, Avril will return with a lecture about California ceramics titled, Let's Talk Tabletop. Uh, for Sweet Thursday, there will not be a Sweet Thursday in December. And then in January on the 27th, there will be the first in-person event hosted by the Friends since the beginning of the pandemic. It will be held at 7 p.m. in person in the library complex in the Don Tatson Community Hall. The author will be Jasmine Darznick, and the book is The Bohemians. And look for more information on this uh, in the future. On Thursday, February 10th at 5 p.m., Sweet Thursday will host a webinar featuring author William Kent Kruger, who has written This Tender Land. And on Thursday, March 10th at 5 p.m., Sweet Thursday will host a webinar with author Dr. Suzanne Coben, who has written Letter to a Young Female Physician. And then uh, also in March on the 9th, which is a Wednesday in the WOW time slot of 2 p.m., WOW and Sweet Thursday will collaborate on an event when we will host a webinar featuring author Gabrielle Seltz in a discussion of her recently released book, Light on Fire, The Art and Life of Sam Francis. And if you've missed a webinar or loved it so much you want to watch it again or share it with your uh, friends and neighbors and relatives, you can visit our YouTube channel where you can find all the webinars we have been permitted to record. Not every museum or author allows us to record the uh, lectures. And our YouTube channel can be found at tinyurl.com forward slash friends LLLC hyphen YouTube. And we will re-recording today's webinar. To ask questions today, please use the Q&A function on your computer or device. Please type in the question and at the end of the lecture, we will choose a selection of questions to answer. Since there are always audience members who may be new to the Lafayette Library, and there's always a few, I'd like to share with you how best to learn and sign up for upcoming lectures. There's two basic ways. Uh, the first is to get on the weekly email list put out on Saturday mornings by the Library Foundation. There is a subscribe function on the Foundation's website, and you can find that at llcf.org forward slash subscribe. Alternatively, you could go to the Contra Costa Library website, and toward the top, there's an events tab, and that will take you to upcoming events where you can see every event scheduled for all 26 branch libraries in Contra Costa County. Now that may be overwhelming, but you can whittle it down to something manageable by using the filters on the left. For example, location or age or type of event. And now a little bit about the Friends of the Library. Uh, for many, many years, we've sold donated used books to support our library. We have a retail store called Friends Corner Bookshop, which is located on the lower level of the library building on the back on Golden Gate Way. And it houses about 15 to 20,000 affordably priced volumes. We also sell higher value books through Amazon. And with these funds, we support the library through paying for extended hours when the library is open on Sunday, which it is currently not since none of the um, county libraries are open. <clears throat> 
We also enable the library to purchase books and related materials. We support programs for all age groups uh, from children through seniors. And this is not only our own programs, but also programs put on by the librarians. And we also provide some uh, support for the partners in the uh, facility and the facilities themselves. If you're interested in purchasing books from the Friends to support the library, you can go to the Friends website at llcf.org forward slash friends hyphen book hyphen shop. And there you can find the hours that were open and the guidelines for making book donations. And you can find the all important Amazon button. And lastly, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Avril Angevine, who's been a very popular lecturer here at the library, both on the webinars and previously in person. Avril, Avril describes herself as an art educator, a lecturer, a Francophile, a dog lover, and a, very, a fashionista, a very eclectic person. She delivers independent art lectures through libraries, the East Bay Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, and other organizations. She's also a docent at SF MoMA and the Oakland Museum. So thank you for speaking to us today, and I'm going to take my slides down. Okay. So are we are we ready, Ellen? Ready yes, to go? We are. <laughs> right, all ready for you. Okay, great. Well, uh, hello everybody out in Lafayette. I'm glad to be with you today. Would uh, love to be in person, but Zoom is just as good on a day when it's misty and raining. And let me pull my screen up here. And okay, here we go. Share a screen. Slideshow from the beginning. There we go. Okay, so uh, we're here today to talk about what many people consider the absolute best American art, or at least it's widely considered the first American art that was taken seriously in the art world. And that's the abstract expressionism uh, of the 1940s and 50s, uh, what we call the New York School. Now, abstraction as a style of art, as a style of Western art, began right around the turn of the 20th century. Now, early 20th century abstraction uh, rejected the use of the human figure or of anything else recognizable uh, in a search for the spiritual, an effort to understand universal forces that are greater than what humanity or even nature uh, has wrought. To a great extent, their search came in response to the materialism, the rapid uh, and extreme changes uh, of the modern machine age, and certainly in response to the catastrophic politics of the early 20th century. But in the 20s and 30s, uh, the search for understanding kind of shifted from the spiritual plane, we might say, to the level of the individual psyche on the one hand, uh, and to the political world on the other, giving us surrealism and social realism. Now, the ideas of Sigmund Freud about the power of the unconscious on human actions were taken up by the surrealist artists who gelled into a group just at the time that Freud's works were being translated into French. The surrealist goal was exploration of those mysterious unconscious forces that guide our behavior. Now, of course, many surrealist paintings could also be considered somewhat abstract, something that we see in Joan Miro, for example. Uh, other surrealist works fall someplace in between abstraction and figuration, such as we see in Salvador Dali and his strange combinations. And other uh, surrealists like René Magritte were as far from abstraction as you can be and yet uh, contain us important sense, a certain sense of otherworldliness. So surrealism travels across the Atlantic and gained many followers in the States. But on this side of the pond, it ran into a different vibe, the social realist style, what came to be called American scene painting that took hold in the desperate 1930s. Now, in these works, many of which appeared in murals created through the WPA and other government agencies, art regains a political edge and a social function. Abstraction was not suited to this task and was strenuously avoided, although there were some artists who managed to combine surrealism and social realism. 
uh, by locating the irrationality central to surrealism in social and political life, such as we see in James Guy's Industrial Symphony. James Guy was the New England surrealist, if that's not an oxymoron. There he is. Now, so it's through surrealism and surrealism's concern to express something about the in individual's interior world that abstraction enters uh, American painting. Many of the painters I'm going to discuss today were surrealists before they committed to abstraction. And as with the early century forms of abstraction, it was a world war that kickstarted the movement away from representation. Now, as I'm sure you know, Paris had been the center of Western art production for a couple of centuries, but the Nazi invasion kind of put an end to that. Um, and it was very sad. Now, of course, after the war, art was still being made in Paris and certain American artists, such as Sam Francis, who you're gonna hear about <laughs> in a few weeks, or Ellsworth Kelly, or for that matter, Jean Kelly, uh, went to Paris for inspiration, but the far larger movement was westward. Many French, German, and Eastern European artists migrated to New York before and during the war, and for more basic reasons than art. Marcel Duchamp, Hans Hoffmann, Max Ernst, and Pete Mondrian brought abstraction with them. Uh, André Breton, Yves Tanguy, Marc Chagall, and Fernand Leger brought surrealism. And through their exhibitions and their teaching, the European emigres provided an electrical charge that eclipsed American scene painting and established New York as the world's art capital. But of course, the centrality of New York at this time reflected political reality too. After the war, America was certainly great, the leading nation economically, militarily, and morally, and young American artists, many of whom had served in the war, were full of enthusiasm and cultural invincibility. The seeds brought by the European emigres when planted in New York produced unique and fabulous fruit. And so this is how the New York School was born not as a unified movement necessarily, but just as a small group of artists who hung out at the Cedar Tavern on West 8th Street uh, in New York uh, and exploded everything everybody knew about making art. They were to art what the European existentialists were to literature, seekers of meaning in an irrational universe who valued not merely the thinking subject, but the acting, feeling, living human individual. They wanted an art that reflected the deeply human and tapped into inner sources through direct, unplanned expression of feeling. They seized on the surrealist, automatic, anti-rational art making of free gesture and improvisation. Spontaneity and process, that is how the work was actually made, these were crucial. Yet in a famous letter to the New York Times uh, in June 1943, Adolf Gottlieb and Mark Rothko wrote, to us, art is an adventure into an unknown world of the imagination, which is fancy free and violently opposed to common sense. They continued, there is no such thing as a good painting about nothing. We assert that the subject is critical. Really, that last statement there may surprise you. When we're talking about abstraction, how can the subject matter be critical? Doesn't look like there is any. Well, there are a couple of ways to respond to that. On the one hand, the stunning formal innovations that they created were done in a search for absolutes in human life and experience, not in the spirituality that the early abstractionists saw. Carl Jung's ideas about the collective unconscious were as central to the abstract expressionists as Freud's had been to the surrealists. So early works such as Arshiel Gorky's The Liver is the Coxcomb there uh, were full of these biomorphic elements and references to primitive myth and archaic art used as personal symbols. Thus, the psyche of the artist spontaneously rendered was effectively the subject of an abstract expressionist painting. And another way of looking at the question of subject is simply this. 
the creation of the work was the subject. The process of painting what were normally really monumental canvases involved not just the wrist, but the entire body and engaging fully with the application of paint was what made you an artist. This is why it was called action painting. In a sense, this was the culmination of a movement begun way back with the Impressionists of making the canvas itself more significant than what was represented on it. So the abstract expressionists thus had it both ways, as painting itself was both the process and the subject of a painting. But unlike, say, cubism, in which uh, many efforts are constructed similarly, and as you probably know, in early Picasso cubism, you can't tell the difference between Picasso and Brock, they're so similar. But in abstract expressionism, there were many styles because the artist's personal stamp was so important. That said, the artists tend to fall into two camps, the gesture painters and the color field painters, but they have some things in common. Uh, a focus, for example, on how the paint is applied to the canvas, that was really important, and spontaneity, that is lack of preparation, of underdrawing and things like that, that involve rational processes of image making. Uh, they also focused on edge to edge application in which no part of the painting appeared to be more important than another. And finally, they are enormous, generally speaking. Uh, and these last two uh, were holdovers from the mural painting of the 30s. Murals are by their nature large and they generally fill their space up really fully. So let's meet some serious, soulful, hard drinking artists of the New York School. We'll start with the gesture artists and the top dog in this department is of course, Jackson Pollock. Pollock virtually alone created the image of the American cowboy macho artist, a sort of James Dean of the art world, drinking, misbehaving and abandoning the normal tools of painting including paintbrushes and an easel in his search for direct access to the turmoil in his psyche. Now, this caricature of Pollock is not completely accurate, of course. He, he was Western, he was from Wyoming and he spent his youth in the West. But as a teenager, he was artsy and was even interested in theosophy, which was the inspiration for Pete Mondrian's work. And he only took up this cowboy image once he came to New York where he studied with Thomas Hart Benton, uh, the great American scene muralist. Now, Pollock didn't burst onto the scene as an abstract provocateur. He had training and he found inspiration in many early century artists, but he did have demons. Because he has had lost part of a finger in a childhood accident involving an ax, his drawing was always clumsy. And as you know, he suffered from alcoholism, was hospitalized for it in the 1930s. And of course it led to his death in a car crash in 1956. Pollock underwent Jungian analysis in the early forties, which certainly enriched his work. He was a troubled and troubling soul. His splatter paintings for which uh, a wit at Life Magazine named him Jack the Dripper, happened all in a glorious rush between 1947 and 1950. Prior to that, his work had been figurative, probably don't recognize this as a Jackson Pollock, uh, then it was symbolic and mythological. And as we can see with SF MoMA's Guardians of the Secret, he often um, started with a figure, which he then hid. There's lots of figures in here, even in the central portion, which is kind of the most abstract, there are figures marching around. Um, and we can see this also in the giant mural that he did uh, for Peggy Guggenheim's New York apartment, there it is. There are black stick figures marching across it. Now, referring to its overall style, critics called it glorified wallpaper and baked macaroni and things like that. But in Pollock's word, it was a stampede of every animal in the American West, cows and horses and antelopes and buffaloes. Everything is charging across that goddamn surface, he said. 
Now, Pollock was searching for a way to create a continuous line rather than strokes, brush strokes, no matter how long they might be. His solution was to pour house paint from a can along a stick resting inside the container so that a constant stream of paint dripped onto the canvas, which was left unstretched on the floor. Now, the character of the line could be varied in many ways by the thickness of the paint or by the angle and then the speed of the pouring and also by the dynamics of his own bodily gestures. An early work uh, in the drip mode is this one, Full Fathom 5 from 1947, where he actually started with an underlayer um, uh, made with brush and palette knife and then he dripped on top of it. Uh, the grayish color in here is uh, aluminum radiator paint. And there are tacks, coins, cigarette butts, and other forms of junk embedded in it. Once he began to drip, he didn't touch the canvas except to step on it. Now, here's a close up of that work. And as you can see, I'll go back. There's hard, we managed to get a close up of the red, which there is very little of in here. That shows you the kind of uh, gestures he was making. Now, Pollock called his painting studio his arena, casting himself as a bullfighter or gladiator. And a work was an environment around which he danced, throwing paint from all sides. And in fact, his works had no correct orientation. He decided later how they should be hung. From 1947 to 50, uh, Pollock stayed sober and produced some of the most dazzling, absorbing works ever achieved in American art. Their sheer size is impressive, but more impressive is the delicacy of the lines and slashes of paint, which arch and swirl everywhere at once. They aren't messy or muddled, um, as they would be if they had been done by the famous five-year-old who is supposed to be able to do abstract painting, or if you did them, or if I did them, they would be messy and muddled. Pollock's wife, the painter Lee Krasner, marveled at how he could work in the air and yet know where the paint would land. He seemed to enter a trance state when painting, as though he had broken through the difficult personality he struggled with and attained something like the transcendent state, perhaps, that the early abstractionists sought. Visitors to a 1950 exhibit said that it was like walking into a meteor shower. Now, his painting style, uh, as much as his personality, his personal style, has been parodied but think about it, a really good painter could forge a Vermeer, but you could not exactly replicate a Pollock. Here's green silver, wonderful work of his, and autumn rhythm. He would even throw the skin which formed on the surface of an open can of paint. He'd throw that on the surface as well. And here's, let's see, uh, another close up of the surface here where you can see um, much more, you get much more sense of the white of the canvas showing through, the unprimed canvas. And here's blue poles. It's really hard to get a sense of these works without seeing them, without being there. They're so large. Now, Pollock fell off the wagon in 1950, and in the last few years of his life, his drinking and erratic behavior increased. He gave up color in 1951 and attempted to develop a new style, applying paint from a turkey baster, rather like the later color field painters would do. Okay, here's one. You can't really say that he advanced, but really, did he have to? His work is a testament to what can happen when an artist is in the zone, totally in sync with herself and her cultural moment. Cultural historian Camille Paglia called him a shooting star, and like James Dean, he checked out way too soon. So <clears throat> Pollock's contemporary, his friend and rival, number two to Pollock's number one, and sometimes number one to Pollock's number two, was Willem de Kooning. De Kooning, who was born in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, is considered a protean artist uh, in the mold of Picasso. That is someone prodigiously talented who transcended all puny definitions such as style or influence 
and in that sense was an artist's artist. But he looked for inspiration in the world rather than inside himself. And thus he complicated abstract expressionism by figural references, specifically in the series of six woman paintings he did uh, in the early 50s, which set both conservative and avant-garde critics howling, of course, for different reasons. But de Kooning didn't care about styles or labels. He only wanted to be inspired. And as he once said, flesh was the reason oil paint was invented. Now, de Kooning arrived in New York, having stowed away on a freighter in 1926 when he was 22, hoping to become a commercial artist. He had extensive and rigorous training in drawing and painting in the Netherlands. And once in the US, he worked as a house painter. His technical training, which we can see in this sketch of his wife, Elaine, and his familiarity with loose paint and big brushes combined to form the basis of his process. De Kooning was always open about his debt to other artists, such as his mentor, Arshiel Gorky, and to the importance of continued contact with his peers. Uh, in 1949, de Kooning and 17 other artists founded the club, a loft on East 8th Street where they gathered to talk and to drink too, a little bit of that. Pollock was a frequent and boisterous attendee. Now, like Pollock, de Kooning was a problem drinker, but in other ways, they were quite different. Pollock succeeded by overcoming his artistic drawbacks, while de Kooning actually had to overcome the skill acquired through his extensive training. Let's have a look at one of his works. He struggled to attain the freedom and spontaneity that was natural to Pollock. De Kooning worked and reworked and reworked his paintings, and he hesitated to show them. He didn't have a solo show until he was 44, although he was already well known to the New York art crowd as an inspirational figure with the most solid grounding in both art techniques and art history. Now, while his works have the same abstract expressionist spirit as Pollock's, they were constructed differently. They often seem incomplete, as if the forms are moving and kind of coming into definition. His continual reworking testifies to the importance of process. And in this sense, his paintings like Pollock's can rightly be considered action paintings. The painting is an event, an encounter between the artist and the materials rather than a finished work in the traditional sense. So this early work called Pink Angels you can find echoes of Miro possibly, and certainly Matisse's kinds of color. Um, this was done as de Kooning's method was kind of taking shape. Now he would draw shapes onto paper and then trace them onto the canvas, which allowed for uh, complex layering and sudden shifting animation of the surface. And he doesn't try to hide this process. The charcoal underdrawing can be seen here um, outlining the shapes. Now, while most of the abstract expressionists whose religion was spontaneity denied that they made any sketches, de Kooning found a method that allowed for construction and reconstruction while retaining an aura of spontaneity. And you can see looking at this that there are suggestions of body parts in here um, and things that even evoke surrealist kind of imagery without the actual use of symbols at all. Another early work of his called Asheville. Uh, we can see again the use of black, the importance of line for him, a really nice use of color and always, always a sense of things that look like figures, squares, houses, so forth. Um, some people say that any abstract painting, when we look at it, we seek to find something that we can recognize, but I think you can do that in here. Now, in his first solo exhibition in 1948, de Kooning showed compositions like this one in black and white with, again, vaguely recognizable shapes and a complex interaction between figure and ground, which, as he said, was always his true subject. The reduction of the palette to black and white amplifies this tension between the foreground and the background, the black background. And the calligraphic white lines remind us that he was once a sign painter. 
Uh, abstract expressionists like Pollock were interested in symbols and ideographs as a way to communicate a universal human emotion or experience. And critic Harold Rosenberg even claimed that organic shapes could carry an emotional charge the way numbers, mathematical signs, or letters of the alphabet could. Now, here is excavation here is the biggest painting that de Kooning uh, ever did. He was a committed easel painter. That's another way he's different from Pollock. This one is about six and a half by eight feet, far smaller than many abstract expressionist works. And de Kooning explained, if I stretch my arms out and wonder where my fingers are, that's all the space I need as a painter. To move beyond this scale, he thought, you would risk losing the human intimacy of the space. Now, Pollock, of course, clearly wanted to go beyond his human reach. Uh, so this here uh, excavation is an all over painting with no obvious point of entry, though down at the bottom, there's something that looks kind of like a door or a window. We might go in there. And it's a super example of the tension and de Kooning between abstraction and figuration that we find in his work. And you can see, I think you can easily see teeth in there. Now, his point of departure for this work was an image of women working in a rice field from a 1949 Italian neorealist film called Bitter Rice. OK, so here it is. <laughs> this is the inspiration for the work we were just looking at. Uh, OK, let's look at it again. So what can we see in here? I don't know if we can see the rice, if we can see the women, we can see bird and fish shapes human noses, eyes, teeth, jaws even. And the title even reflects its composition, uh, an intensive building up and scraping down of the paint layers. Uh, sometimes this process would take months until the desired uh, effect was achieved. So in other words, these paintings, which look perhaps like they were done in a rush, that's not necessarily the case. They were well considered. Now, de Kooning engaged with a more defined, more specific figuration in the woman series. Um, all six of them were exhibited in 1953, and purists were shocked, of course, but in many ways, these works continued the path he had been on. Okay, here's the one that SF MoMA. This aggressive woman is based in part on uh, Mesopotamian figures that he had seen at the Met in New York. Okay, so that's the art part and the contemporary part that inspired him were these American ads for Pepsodent and things like that featuring glowing women. He cut these out of magazines and he was known to paste these, cut out these smiles and even paste them onto a painting. And again, though these works look spontaneous, um, they were worked on for months. The paint is thick in some places and thin in others, opaque some places, translucent others. Here's uh, three more of the women paintings that are a little more, more abstract even than the first one. Now, by the early 1960s, Pollock, uh, de Kooning, sorry, had moved out to Long Island quite near where Pollock lived, in fact. And he began a series of landscapes that returned to a more fully abstract mode, such as this one. Now, a work like this might remind you of the works of one of our favorite California painters when he went to Southern California. Yes, kind of like Richard Diebenkorn, who uh, was in fact influenced by these works of de Kooning. De Kooning continued painting through the 70s and 80s, creating luminous, luscious paintings. In the 80s, in failing health, he developed an entirely different abstract style, using primary colors and open ribbon-like forms. Now, many people figure or consider that his later works here to have declined in quality, attributing this to the onset of some form of dementia. But other people say that painting like de Kooning's uh, comes from intuition, comes from instinct, and comes from the artist's hand. Basically, you don't really need your brain to do it. And that this stayed with him right till the end. Right? And then he died in 1997. So I have one more gesture list to show you, and that is Joan Mitchell. Um, 
while Lee Krasner and Elaine de Kooning were overshadowed as artists by their powerful husbands in the macho New York art world, Joan Mitchell competed with these guys and carved out a career that lasted until the late 80s. Now, I'm sure you know, I hope you do, that SF MoMA currently has an exciting and humongous retrospective of her work. Uh, so if you aren't familiar with her, let's fix that right now. So Mitchell was born in Chicago uh, to a wealthy family with an apartment on the 12th floor of a building with a view of Lake Michigan. And she actually said that all her paintings begin in Lake Michigan. Her mother was a poet and editor of Poetry Magazine. So people like T.S. Eliot and Dylan Thomas, you know, came to the house. Reading poetry was important to her and it was part of her painting process even. Now, as a young girl, she was a serious art student as well as an accomplished artist, uh, accomplished athlete. She um, was sort of a junior figure skating champion and her athleticism, I think you'll see, is part of what she calls on to create her monumental works. Uh, she went to Smith College and graduated actually from the Art Institute of Chicago. And let's look at an early work of her. So you can see, right, she's been what she's been looking at, Picasso and so forth. So she traveled in Europe where her paintings moved towards abstraction and where she met her husband uh, in 1949. Returning to New York, she soon had a reputation as one of the leading younger American abstractionists. She exhibited regularly in New York throughout the next four decades and maintained close friendships with many New York school painters and poets, though she returned frequently to France. She divorced her husband in 1952, the year she had her first uh, gallery show, where we find this work called Lyric. So I think if you look at this work, oh, number one, lyric. So um, poetry, as I said, was very important to her. And this has a sense of some of de Kooning's early works in it, like uh, Asheville. I think the shapes are similar to that. And in fact, de Kooning was an influence to her and encouraged her. Um, interesting here are these kind of geometric shapes and the bright color. But again, it's an all over painting, as we expect. In 1955, she moved to France to be with the French Canadian artist and race car driver, Jean Paul Riopel. They had a long and tumultuous relationship. They maintained separate homes all the time, but they would eat dinner together. And of course, they drank together every day. Eventually, they moved from Paris to Vetoy, uh, quite near Monet's home at Giverny. Her painting masters were Matisse and Van Gogh, two of the greatest modern colorists, and she learned their lessons really, really well. So Joan Mitchell is an American artist with a French soul, I like to say. So having adopted abstraction in France in the late 40s, she stayed with that genre through a 50-year career that saw radical shifts in art during that time. Um, as Rothko said, subject was always paramount to her. Her paintings reflect a feeling about something seen in the world, water, sky, trees, the weather, Lake Michigan, dogs even. She was more than anything else a landscapist. And she painted, I think, the way romantic poet William Wordsworth wrote a poem. As he said, he would be transmitting a, overpower, a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings recollected in tranquility. Um, she worked primarily at night and rarely if ever painted from life. So in other words, she saw something, thought about it and came back and painted in solitude, except for the company of her dogs, listening to music or reading poetry. Her sources were often named in her titles, uh, which were painted, which were created after the painting was complete. So here's some of her more abstract work, Hemlock from 1956. Uh, so the title comes from a line in a poem by Wallace Stevens, and it's the first of many paintings that refer directly to poetry, uh, which plays such a vital role in her work, particularly during the 1970s. Now, Hemlock is a tree, I think you can see that there. Uh, okay, city life, city landscape from 1955. So a city was also a landscape 
uh, for Mitchell. She did many things that were based on urban scenes. Um, and I think you can see, get a sense of landscape in here. We have the top is clearer. That's kind of like the sky and everything. And uh, these wonderful central marks she uses. And she was quite daring with her use of red and pink. It's unusual. Her paintings were, let's see a couple more of them, built slowly and carefully. Again, these were not done in a frenzy, as some people often assume looking at them. She would stand back and look at a blank canvas or a painting in progress for long periods of time, decide where each mark should go, and then approach the work and paint quickly and confidently. Sometimes the arc of her arm can be seen in the brush strokes uh, in many of her paintings, especially up at the top where she was extending her reach. And her work really synthesizes a multitude of contrasting concepts and forms, light and dark, warm and cool, space and density, growth and decay, gravity and lightness. You can see that here. So by 1967, Mitchell had bought her place in Betoy, which gave her uh, the space to create larger work. So as you will see, if you go to SF MoMA, by the end, her paintings get really, really large. Um, Sometimes they were triptychs or made even of four panels to make them even larger than she could accommodate in her studio. And there's one called No Rain. So something like this, it's a two panel painting. It's sometimes interesting to look and see how different the two sides are. What's going on there? It's called No Rain. It's based on a, a Van Gogh painting. And this is... La Vie en Rose. This was done after her breakup with Riopelle. And again, the four panels are different. Do they indicate uh, kind of a narrative? Not quite sure. Um, this one has a lot of mauve in it. And this is a color that she used kind of in reference to um, Riopelle. She had other color associations that were very important to her. Yellow was her happy color. Green and white indicated sadness and death to her. Uh, this is Bracket, that's at SF MoMA. You've probably seen this many times. Um, she would work on one part of these triptychs at a time with the other ones often nearby. Uh, some of them, some of the triptychs apart may have been lost. Um, and one thing that's interesting to look at are where the marks cross from one to another, one panel to another, and you can see that in, in bracket. And it's interesting in her work to look for layers, for what's painted first, what's painted last. Often white was added late to push back against the other colors. And her drips are interesting. They are different depending on the paint consistency and uh, they show that she didn't turn the canvas. Sometimes a drip will stop, which means she lay the canvas down flat. Um, during the last 10 years of her life, uh, she was very ill. Bracket was done during this period, and yet some of her last works are extraordinarily powerful. This No Birds was done uh, as an homage to uh, one of Van Gogh's latest paintings, last paintings, Wheatfield with Crows. Here, let me look back at it. Um, I think you can see similarities. And to her, this was not a suicidal painting as she thought that Van Gogh's was. There's Van Gogh. And as one of her last uh, paintings is this one, Trees. She said her works were about making a picture, not just letting it happen. And so in a sense, her works show a shift in abstraction from chance, hazard, and uncontrolled freedom to a new direction with breath and freshness and within a sort of structured uh, armature. So now we're going to shift gears a bit and move to the other end of the abstract expressionist spectrum, the smooth operators who give up wild surface agitation for large swaths of pure color. Now, stylistic oppositions of this sort, like between a focus on line and a focus on color, or between a classical balanced style and a romantic asymmetric style, 
uh, these dichotomies have a compelling logic and help explain periods and styles and making them possible to explain in art history classes. But the dichotomy, uh, like all such dichotomies, isn't as clean and clear as we might like. And the two abstract expressionist camps actually do have many things in common. For example, they all believed in the power of abstraction at the, and the unconscious as being the source of art um, by their belief that the role of the artist was to reveal the unknown rather than report on the visible. And finally, by their conviction that an authentic painting expressed the artist's personality. And it was assumed that a work of art was loaded with the artist's baggage and that the viewers approached it with baggage of their own. So the king of the color painters, of course, is Mark Rothko, who has the soul of an existentialist, I think, as you can see in his famous quote that he's expressing the big emotions, tragedy, ecstasy, and doom. But he chooses a really interesting way to express these things. Rothko's floating rectangles appear more introspective and even more impassive than the work of someone like de Kooning, say, rather than bravura gesture. This is number 14, huge painting at SF MoMA. Rothko relies on very minimal inflection and color that seems to have seeped into the very canvas so that it draws attention to the surface yet manages to suggest limitless space. Color relationships, in other words, take precedence over marks of emotional turmoil. Now, though for Rothko, color was not symbolic as it was to someone like uh, Mondrian, it was full of emotions and associations. Now, no matter how restrained such a painting might seem, it could address the viewer's emotions and intellect through the eye as music did through the ear. So Rothko was born in what's now Latvia in 1903. He and his family emigrated to the United States and settled in Portland, Oregon when he was 10. Rothko attended Yale University in 1921. He found Yale pretentious and racist and gave up his studies to move to New York City, where he worked in the garment district before studying at Parsons with Arshil Gorky. He did receive an honorary degree from Yale 46 years later. Now in the 1930s, Rothko painted mostly street scenes and interiors while teaching children at the Brooklyn Jewish Children's Center, which he did for more than 20 years. He admired the emotional approach of children's art and adopted a style um, characterized by deliberate deformations and kind of a crude application of paint. And he began a book on the similarities between children's art and modern art. By the mid 40s, his works are characterized by this kind of biomorphic style reminiscent of the surrealists whose influence was strong, as I said, in New York at the time, there's another. But by 1947, Rothko had virtually eliminated all elements of surrealism or mythic imagery from his works and non-objective compositions of indeterminate shapes kind of appear. Rothko is now relying on shape rather than biomorphic um, uh, motifs to convey emotional states. And he began to paint the edges of his stretched canvases, which he displayed without frames, which are restrictive. There is more power in telling little than telling all, he said. And he largely abandoned conventional titles in 1947. And he also resisted explaining the meaning of his work. Silence is so accurate, he said, and he feared that explanation, like titles, would only paralyze the viewer's imagination. So in a sense, he transferred a watercolor style to his oil paintings by diluting his pigments and applying paint in very thin overlapping blazes, which are often composed of both oil and egg-based media, achieving a startling luminosity. His liquid paint soaks the canvas, leaving soft, indistinct edges, and whitish outlines surround some of the shapes, almost like halos. Uh, the artist's technique, which he was cagey about explaining, appears simple, but on close examination, the surface is richly varied. Paint can even see, be seen running upwards across the surface sometimes because he would invert a painting 
uh, while working on it. By 1950, he had reduced the number of floating re rectangles to two, three, or four, and aligned them vertically against a colored ground, arriving at his signature style. From that time on, he would work almost invariably within this format, uh, managing to suggest an astonishing range of atmosphere and moods by variations of color and tone. But his work began to darken dramatically during the late 50s, subsequent to his work on his disastrous first mural commission for the Four Seasons restaurant in the Seagram building in New York City. The Four Seasons had space for only seven murals, but Rothko eventually executed 30 of them, uh, horizontal rather than his usual vertical to fit the restaurant's setting. Always uncomfortable with the elite, he told an interviewer that his goal was to create something that will ruin the appetite of every son of a bitch who ever eats in that room and if that's not enough, that his paintings would make patrons feel that they are trapped in a room where all the doors and windows are bricked up so that all they can do is butt their heads forever against the wall. That's what he's talking about, okay? Here's the darker one. Eventually, Rothko decided that the installation was inappropriate for his works. And in 1960, he canceled the contract and returned Seagram's money. Uh, these murals are now in three places, in the Tate, in the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., and in a museum in Japan. So this whole incident was memorialized in two films and in the play Red with Alfred Molina from a couple of years ago. Nevertheless, Rothko's star was rising and his paintings were collected by the very sons of bitches who ate at the Four Seasons, like the Rockefellers. He was even seated next to Joe Kennedy at JFK's inaugural ball in 1961. But the dark Seagram's palette continued to dominate his work well into the 60s. Um, art historian Dor Ashton said his surfaces were as velvety as poems of the night. Between 64 and 67, he worked on the Rothko Chapel paintings commissioned by John and Dominique de Menil in Houston, Texas. This is an enclosed octagonal space, kind of the form of a Byzantine church, which lends itself to meditation and was intended to be Rothko's final artistic statement. Uh, unfortunately, he never saw these dark paintings uh, installed in situ. On February 25th, uh, 1970, Rothko's assistant found the artist dead on his kitchen floor, having overdosed on barbiturates and having cut an artery in his arm with a razor blade on the very day that the Seagram murals arrived at the Tate Gallery. Okay, sad. So we'll find more color and less evidence of the artist's hand in the works of Helen Frankenthaler, here she goes, a second generation abstract expressionist who started what came to be called color field style. Um, as Marcel Duchamp wisely said, art is either plagiarism or revolution, and Frankenthaler's poured sheets of color caused at least a minor revolution. Like the 1970s uh, minimalists, such as sculptor John Donald Judd or painter Frank Stella, Frankenthaler seeks the least possible intervention in art making, relying on the quality of materials oops, rather than reference to either the interior or the exterior worlds. Another quote from Frank Stella that kind of helps understand Helen Frankenthaler, what you see is what you see. So she was born in 1928, uh, from, came from a privileged, cultured, and progressive Jewish intellectual family. She and her sisters were encouraged to prepare for a professional career, and her art interest began early. Uh, she studied with Mexican painter Rufino Tamayo while at the Dalton School, and after graduation from Bennington, she studied with Hans Hoffmann. She was staggered by Jackson Pollock's first exhibition in 1950. And she said, it was all there. I wanted to live in this land. I had to live there and master the language. Now, despite de Kooning's luscious handling of color, Frankenthaler actually saw more possibilities in Pollock's process, especially in his throwing and scattering of, of paint on loose canvas on the floor. 
So by 1951, she had a gallery contract and her first show. And in 1952, she really broke out with this work, Mountains and Sea, the revolutionary debut of her painting method. So we can see her here. She poured thinned paint directly onto raw, unprimed canvas on the studio floor, working from all sides to create floating fields of translucent color. Now, she learned this from Pollock, of course, but his dribbled enamel paint stayed on the surface of the canvas. Frankenthaler's thinned poured paint soaked in and became part of it, seeming almost like a watercolor. Uh, the Mountains and Sea here uh, was painted after a trip to Nova Scotia, and it calls into question just how non-representational the painting is. Elements of it suggest a kind of seascape or landscape. Uh, the blue and the green there, and something like this Basque landscape, you can say the same. It seems to refer to a specific external environment, though it is completely abstract. Throughout the 50s, her work tended to be towards centered compositions, like this one, with the majority of the painting happening in the middle of the canvas, while the edges were of little importance. Later, she began to experiment with more linear shapes and more organic, uh, sun-like, rounded forms in her works. In the 60s, her style shifted towards the exploration of symmetrical paintings, and she began to place strips of color near the edges of her paintings, thus involving the edges as part of the composition and a general simplification of styles. She began to make use of single space, uh, stains and blots of solid color against white backgrounds, often in the form of geometric shapes. Now, her soak stain was said to be the ultimate fusing of image and canvas, drawing attention to the flatness of the painting itself. But a disadvantage of the method is that the oil in the paints eventually causes the canvas to discolor and rot away. So beginning in 1963 with a work like this one, Pink Lady, Frankenthaler begins to use acrylic paints rather than oils because they stay bright and they spread easily, they dry quickly, and they could be both thin or thick, opaque on the canvas. And by the 70s, uh, the thicker paint and bright colors, reminiscent almost of fauvism, uh, is characteristic of her work. There's another one century. Okay. Uh, throughout the 70s, Frankenthaler explored the joining of areas of the canvas through modulated hues, and she experimented with large abstract forms. And her work in the 80s, such as stargazing, was characterized as much calmer with muted colors, relaxed brushwork. She did use the brush and other implements uh, in her work later on, or this one, yin yang. At her death, uh, in 2011, when she was 83, the obituary in the New York Times summed up Frankenthaler's career. This way, critics have not unanimously praised Ms. Frankenthaler's art. Some have seen it as thin in substance, uncontrolled in method, too sweet in color, and too poetic. But admirers like Barbara Rose wrote in 1972 of Frankenthaler's gift for the freedom, spontaneity, openness, and complexity of an image, not exclusively, of the studio or of the mind, but explicitly and intimately tied to nature and human emotions. So finally, for our last artist, I want to look at an artist of the second generation, the color field group, who took the free unstretched canvas of Pollock and Frankenthaler one step further, making it a sort of painting sculpture. In the 1960s, pop art and minimalism were in different ways responding to the emotional interior focused abstract expressionism by turning to the everyday in subject and sometimes even in materials. So the painter Sam Gilliam brought abstraction into conversation with the everyday when laundry hanging on a line seen out his studio window inspired him to hang rather than stretch his canvases. As an African-American artist in Washington, D.C. at the height of the civil rights movement, Gilliam's art was not merely an aesthetic statement. It was a way of distancing himself from the white power structures inherent in abstract art. 
in that turbulent decade, few black artists were interested in abstraction, but Gilliam was. He was born in Tupelo, Mississippi in 1933, and received a BA and an MA in art from the University of Louisville, moved to DC in 1962 and tried various experimental techniques with canvas before hitting on his signature draping in 1968. There we go. So as a great abstract expressionist painting, uh, his hanging is both the method which he's doing and also uh, the subject, kind of a metaphor as well. Now, he did make abstract works that referenced uh, society, referenced political events, such as the assassination of Martin Luther King. He always held on to abstraction as a model of freedom. This work, April 4th, which uh, references the day in 1968 when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Um, from the window of his studio, Gilliam witnessed the looting and fires that broke out uh, along 14th Street in Washington, DC upon news of King's death. And a year later when he made this painting, much of the damage remained unrepaired. So this work, the dark, stains are sort of traumatic. Meanwhile, there are luminous, majestic color aspects to it that honor King and his work and perhaps imply a sense of hope. It's a work of his called Double Merge. Gilliam describes the tension between sculptural and pictorial qualities and compares it to the familiar push and pull of color in traditional abstract painting, which comes out of the pedagogy of Hans Hoffmann. And Gilliam likes that his works will never be hung the same way twice. As the soft folds change, so does the painting. This one called Seahorses uh, is on the exterior walls or was of the Smithsonian Museum. Uh, this evolved from the artist's inspiration that these large bronze rings up there on the top were in Greek mythology used to tie seahorses to Neptune's temple. So that's why he called it that. But he does other sorts of work too. Here's a couple um, called Dark As I Am, which includes clothing, a backpack, painter's tools, a wooden closet pole, and a wooden door in there. So not terribly dissimilar to the kind of things Robert Rauschenberg was doing at the time. And in 1975, he started producing geometric collages, which he called black paintings here dense thickets of monochrome paint with collaged, cut, and reused canvas additions on them. And his style changed again in the 80s when he transitioned to using quilted paintings, uh, reminiscent of African patchwork quilts. And his most recent works are textured paintings that incorporate metal forms. So of all the people I've talked about, he is still alive. And let me show you what this 80-year-old has been doing recently. He produced these for the Marrakesh Biennial. It was a work that was commissioned uh, by the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture called Yet Do I Marvel, the title taken from a poem by County Cullen. Uh, this work is 28 feet across, uh, separated into five colorful panels with glassy varnished surfaces. And way back in 1972, Sam Gilliam was the first African-American artist to represent the US at the Venice Biennale. And in 2017, he exhibited once again at the Biennale in the Giardini's Central Pavilion. There he goes with a work called Eve Klein Blue. So in our contemporary world of installations, of sound art, of land art, of street art, of NFTs, is there room for abstract painters? And the answer is, yes, there is. Painters are still building on the work of the past and making it new. People such as um, Julie Moretu, who distills imagery and graphic elements from maps and so forth in her work. And Mark Bradford, a wonderful contemporary California painter who makes works like this from paper that he collages onto the surface and sands down and puts more on and sands it down again. 
or in the work of another California artist, Mary Weatherford, who does what looks like a conventional abstract painting and then surmounts it with neon, bringing a new way of writing with light into these works. So there's still plenty of abstraction about artists uh, seem to love doing it that you can see as you go about. And so uh, thank you very much for allowing me to talk to you today about all this good stuff. And if anybody has any questions, I would be happy to try to answer them anyway. So uh, if people have questions, they can uh, type it into the Q&A. Um, while we're waiting, maybe uh, I might have a few questions. OK, Ellen, you have some questions? Right, so um, early on in the photo of the New York school, they were all men. Yeah. So were there, were there any women in the New York school? And if there were, were they just not allowed to be photographed? Well, I, I don't know why they didn't show up for that photograph, but that photograph is interesting because where does your eye go? It's right there to Pollock. He looks different than everybody. Um, yes, there were uh, female painters. Why they're not in that uh, picture, I don't know. They were not given the same treatment as the men. As I said, well, Joan Mitchell is the main one. Uh, Lee Krasner, who was married to Pollock, Elaine de Kooning, and there were um, many other women, Grace Hardigan, there were a number of them. Uh, there was a book came out a couple of years ago called Ninth Street Women that talks about them. And really what's going on in uh, art history right now is that people are looking back and discovering the works of people like this. Interestingly, at that period in San Francisco, the women artists were a little more accepted. They were a little more uh, present in the social world. But yes, there were um, uh, female abstract painters. But I suppose, given the fact that most of the paintings are really large and physical like this, maybe um, it took women a while to get into that. But yes, there were others. Um, at least I got one. I got two in there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, what other museums in the Bay Area might uh, we find some of uh, works from the people that uh, you discussed today? SF MoMA certainly has some. Um, I think that the de Young, I'm less um, uh, familiar with their collection, but they certainly will have some over there. I, I imagine the Cantor does in uh, at Stanford. But um, really, if you go see the Joan Mitchell show at SF MoMA, right. that'll do it. Uh, it's staggering. But there are other um, abstract works there as well. So. <clears throat> Uh, at this point, uh, is it more likely that uh, people would see them in exhibits rather than just uh, hung in galleries? Um, well, when, there, when there's an exhibit, there was a really cool exhibit several years ago at the Crocker of Sam Francis's work. As I know okay. you have a presentation on Sam Francis. Um, yeah, there are often exhibits like that. And, you know, museums will have a few. I mean, all this stuff. It's more on the East Coast okay. <laughs> than, than here. Um, but yeah, you can see some. Okay. Uh, let's see, there's a uh, comment here. Uh, it's, it's not a question, but it's a big thank you for this presentation. Okay, cool. <laughs> and uh, are there uh, any more questions? Um, right now, I'm only seeing one, right, which was that comment. I know we've run a little bit over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, if there are, no more, then uh, I think we should um, thank you for the presentation and uh, let us all go about our day. Go about our this day. Was this was great. Okay, thank you. All thank right, you. thank you. Thank you, everybody, for allowing me to come and talk today. Oh, someday in person. Yes, someday in person, we hope. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Thank you.